Afternoon, everyone. Uh, thanks again to BIF for inviting me along to, to give this talk. Uh, Mark gave me a bit too much credit when he said I did this paper. Um, I'll, I'll get to that in a second, but this is going to be a talk in assessing the, the use of partial body weights um, and, and those measures for livestock or for, for live weight prediction and average daily gain prediction. Um, can everybody hear me okay? Yep. So this is a paper that was published last year. So essentially, this session is the, the publication or the, the presentation of a paper. Um, the title of the paper, similar to the title of the talk, evaluation of partial body weight for predict or uh, uh, partial body weight for predicting body weight and average daily gain in growing beef cattle. Uh, Mike McNeil, uh, who a lot of you will be familiar with, would have led this study along with Donna Berry from Ireland, Sam Clark from Australia, um, and Michelle Schultz from from South Africa. Uh, published in Translation and Animal Science last year, um, and essentially it was an invitation from um, Vitelli to have a look at some of their data that's coming from their in-pen weighing system, or some of us might have known this as gross safe beef in, in, in earlier years. So the invitation from Vitelli to, to Mike to come have a look at the data, have an independent validation of the data, see what you think about it, is it doing the job we want it to be doing? What are the nuances? Where can we improve it? So that was kind of the, the modus operandi for this. So Mike agreed and had a quick look around and uh, recruited a band of merry men to, to help him out on how we tackle this um, and, and what kind of data we needed. So it's a, the in-pen, the data coming from the in-pen pen weighing system. Um, you know, so Vitelli would have provided the data to to, to have a look at for this study and would have covered the cost, some of the costs um, associated with, with the study. So two chief objectives that were attended to in this paper. One, determine the utility of partial body weights in predicting body weight and average daily gain as estimates from those body weight predictions. Um, and then determine whether these frequent body weights have any um, impact on length of test. So determine the appropriate length of test for predicting average daily gain from daily measures of partial body weight. When we think about the technology, there's a lot of potentials coming from the utilization of uh, frequent weighing, partial weighing. Um, you know, we, we would postulate that it can increase the accuracy of live weight records and the subsequent average daily gain measures that can come from those. It has the opportunity to shorten our test period if we think about the frequency, we're increasing the frequency of observing live weights and live weight gain on animals. Does that have, or does that bring along the ability to shorten the test period? And again, we, we must think about looking at the relevance or the appropriateness of these partial weights and the predictions. Speak a little closer, John. Sure. And we must also think about the, the, you know, what we're evaluating this against, because of course we're going to be evaluating these against shoot weights or, or observed body weight measurements, and of course there's inherent error inside in those body weights also. So we're kind of, you know, looking at the predictions of um, body weights and partial body weights, and we're measuring them against something that may also have error in it, whether it's error at the scales, user error gut fill across a whole test period. So we need to keep all that in mind when we're looking at differences. Um, so does more frequent measuring actually do a better job um, when it comes to, to test periods? There's also management uses as you get more frequent observations of growth rates. You can you know, group cattle a little differently as they go through test. There's less stress in animals. They don't have to go through the shoot um, a whole pile. There's less labor involved, less animal human interaction which is better for welfare and better for for human safety and then there's also probably uh, experimental applications if you're thinking of nutrition trials or feed additive trials maybe really really frequent weighings uh, are necessitated for those type of trials so we got together as a group and had to think about how we'd evaluate this um, so we decided or parameterized the type of data that we were going to request from Vitelli. Um, so essentially we went with a description of a data set that um, consists of performance test groups over a, a number of years from different locations, different breed types, make it as diverse as possible, small and large contemporary groups 
um, minimum size of a tree contemporary group um, and you know get it's about 10,000 animals if you can so we sent Vitality away and they cobbled together the correct data set for us and gave it back to us and sent us on our way so after all said and done and a few edits and posts we just had over a slightly uh, over 9,000 animals to look at data on partial weights predicted weights and shoot weights and all these animals um, different contemporary group sizes from 4 to 123 different lengths of tests from 63 days up to 175 days <coughs> different genotypes boss indicus africans um taurine cattle uh, crosses and composites of all of these and 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 both chief uh, genders re represented uh, bulls and heifers um, on all these animals, we had start, as I say, we had start and end weights in between recorded weights and those partials and daily partial averages and daily predicted averages. So in, inside this uh, system, I should probably go back one slide. Doesn't want to let me go back. Well, so I, I should have probably, uh, you know, alluded to the technology very briefly, but most people are probably familiar with it. Essentially, it takes the partial body weight of the front of the animal. Once it goes, it, you know, a watering trough or a watering can is the, the carrot. Animal goes in, drinks water, partial body weight is taken on the, the front quarters from the load cells. And there's a proprietary algorithm then that can extrapolate the partial body weight to a full body weight. So you can imagine an animal going for water multiple times per day. So you're getting multiple partials, multiple full predictions per day. And we went and worked with the uh, average dailies of each of those partials bodies, uh, partial full, and then we had the recorded weights, the recorded weight at the start and the end and, and the, the intermediate weights. So, I'm not sure if I skipped over a slide, but maybe I didn't. I'll keep going anyway. Um, objective one was to assess the appropriateness of using these partial body weights. So we had the partial body weights, the predicted body weights, um, and we looked at the, the correlations and the differences and the regression coefficients when we looked at each of these pairwise um, uh, comparisons. Then we had the average daily gains that were estimated from the partials, average daily gains estimated from the full predicted and estimate, or average daily gains estimated from the the, the actual measured shoot weights and we had a look to see what are the differences between average daily gains and what are the correlations between the different types of average daily gains. Essentially average daily gain from a partial body weight really has no real life relevance. It, it's more of a predictor or, or a proxy inside the whole thing. Um, and to analyze this, we had lots of growth rates, lots of animals per contemporary group. So using a mixed model, we were able to get solutions per contemporary group, intercepts and slopes per contemporary group. Um, from those mixed model uh, solutions. So I'll just go on and present some of the results of this and essentially the results will be around um, the, the, the correlations between the partials predicted and fulls, the, the regression slopes of one measure and the other, and, and the differences between them. So the difference between an actual and a predicted at any one time. So don't worry, I'm going to skip past this. This is how we presented the results in the paper. So lots of data inside there, lots of numbers. So we did a bit of data visualization on this um, and kind of pulled those numbers out into some graphs and deviation graphs. So what I'm showing here is the regression of body weight on partial body weight on that initial start of test weight. Um, so you'll see the regression coefficients there. there all slightly different there's no one across the board regression coefficient to use so this would differ slightly from some literature recommendations back in the 2015 2016 2017 where one regression coefficient would get a partial to a full predicted weight um, so this is kind of showing that this doesn't work this is at the start of test if we're taking the end of test weight you see a similar variation in the regression coefficients to get from a partial to a, a predicted, you know, I think a literature estimate would suggest 1.6 or 1.7. And um, we can see there's huge difference within contemporary groups, but as time has progressed, you'll remember that some of these contemporary groups are from 2016 to 2020. As time has progressed, as far as I know, Vitelli have started to improve the use 
and the specificity and the bespokeness of the regression coefficients per contemporary group that kind of get dictated. <laughs> You hear me all right? So essentially, we're looking at the differences. We're looking at the differences in regression coefficients that that ex are get exhibited or get discovered across the different contemporary groups. So, a kind of a, a take home from this would be, and it, it's being employed, uh, is to to look at contemporary group specific regression coefficients when you're going from partial to full. Jeez. All right, keep going here in the interest of time. So next we wanted to look at uh, the actual measured body weight and look at the predicted body weight and how they compare to each other. So when you regress one and the other, what you're hoping to find is a regression of one, showing that the predicted body weight and the actual body weight line up pretty, pretty well on target. A lot of contemporary groups you would have found found kind of regression coefficients in and around that one. Um, some of them were statistically different from that one. Um, there was no real relevance to how these contemporary groups were ordered here on the y-axis. Um, it was kind of how the data came into us. There's no relevance temporally or otherwise, but you, I think there might be something to do with the higher contemporary groups, might be older contemporary groups, because we kind of see an improvement in um, fate of the models, improvement of the, the workings of the algorithm as we go towards the, the lower contemporary groups. Um, so that's where the start weight. We get a similar spread of regression coefficients around that one when we look at the end of test weight. And then just if we superimpose those over one another, we kind of see that they're all very similar. There's some contemporary groups that do have slightly different coefficients or prediction accuracies, you could say, when it comes to the start and the end of tests. So that might start pointing at uh, pre uh, the regression coefficient that should be used from a partial to a full may start to change over the, the length of over a, a test period. Uh, finally, on, on this part of the results, we looked at body weight on, um, or looking at the difference between the actual measured body weight and the predicted body weight. Um, so on the x-axis there would be the difference between actual and predicted in, in kilos and the values for different contemporary groups that will be listed on the, the y-axis. So a lot of the differences of the start weight um, are kind of in and around that zero. So real, no real statistical significance different from zero. However, if you move towards the top of that graph, you can see some contemporary groups that do exhibit big differences in a weight at the start of the test when you predict the weight compared to the actual weight. <coughs> Similar spread in this when it comes to the end body weight, you might actually start to see some more statistical significance in the differences between actual and predicted. Um, the, you know, the, the magnitude isn't overly massive. It's, it's all kind of within that 10 kilo range where you might actually think the more animals you put through, that error might actually start to, 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 get, um, to get diluted out. And again, that's just putting those two graphs over each other within each contemporary group, within each shaded or light contemporary group bar there. You kind of want to see how close the green data point and the red data point, greenish data point, are, are to each other. Um, so generally they line up for some contemporary groups where there's a big difference at the end compared to the start, again pointing towards maybe some evolution of that prediction coefficient or that conversion factor from a partial to a full that might need to be taken into account as, as the test progresses. 
These are just some correlations when we look at partials and actuals and, um, and predicted and actuals. Uh, we, again, looking at the test, the, the weight at the start of test, the initial weight and the weight at the end of test. Um, the, the, those two towers there, initial and end, if you look at the right hand column, that's the kind of correlation you really want to look at. That's the correlation between predicted and actual. They all do pretty well. We looked at the differences and the variations in um, in regression coefficients. Um, by and large, most of the correlations between actual and predicted are over 0.9. Um, there's a few blue or coal correlations there. They're the correlations between partial and actual. And as you move just to the column to the right of those, they go from cold to a more warmer color. That means that the, the algorithm is doing a better job of predicting um, or getting a prediction from, from the partial. So some of the discovery, some of the data um, all in behind this, the training data says, um, does a lot for improving the, the predictability of those partials. So kind of just to sum up those few graphs, um, for the weight, the start to test partial weight explained 73 to 99% of measured weight. The predicted weight explained 87 to 99. The end of test weight, the partial weight explained 57 to 99% of the measured weight. And the predicted weight explained 87 to 99. Really, what does that mean? The, the algorithm does improve the coefficient of determination in all of those contemporary groups and reduces the standard error around those predictions. Um, Statistically different coefficients across those contemporary groups would mean, as you know, contrary to what was pointed out in literature previously, is that per contemporary group you actually need a different uh, regression coefficient or different conversion factor converting that partial body weight into a full body weight. So there are all the pieces around predicting live weight, uh, using partial body weight and predicting full body weight. So essentially from all those body weights, what we're getting down to and from a production point of view is we want to measure average daily gain. We want to see those animals that, that, that grow fast compared to growing a little slower. So average daily gain is a, is a key driver of productivity. That's a trait we want to, want to have, have looked at. Um, left hand graph there per contemporary group um, the, the green and the yellows or the green and the reds are average daily gain the red is measured from um, average daily gain from a, a measured weight and the green is average daily gain from a predicted weight so you kind of want these to be as close as possible so this is looking at the difference between the average daily gains measured from a predicted and the average daily gains measured or, or estimated from from an actual shoot weight um, they're laid out there on the left you want within each contemporary group you want them to be close as possible so you can see some contemporary groups the average daily gain from a predicted and average daily gain from a shoot weight are very very similar some of them do differ so if you look at the differences in the right hand graph it's essentially one minus the other um, you want them all to be around zero a good chunk of them are not statistically significantly or statistically significantly different from zero but again some of those contemporary groups towards the higher range again they might be temporally older you you could postulate things that may have got better as, as the year progressed um, you know those big differences can be seen there with some of those contemporary groups and again when you think back to the other graphs and I have a few of them in a slide or two you think back to the other graphs what was happening with those contemporary groups up around the mid-20s they all had kind of regression coefficients that differed from one. They had regression coefficients that were a lot different from that 1.7, 1.6 touted, um, you know, in stone value. So there may be some kind of nuances with those, um, maybe a very mixed contemporary group where you had a lot of different genotypes in that contemporary group. Some of this data was blinded to us because it was proprietary to Vitelli and you know, you could go down rabbit holes trying to explain all of this, but the, the fact that you get a result like this is, is a result in itself. Um, and that's the correlation between those. Um, I won't harp on too much about that. The left hand column is the correlation you, you're really looking at. It's the correlation between average daily gain from an actual and average daily gain from a predicted. Um, again, it's up around those mid 20s uh, that you see some of the correlations fall away, but all the other correlations seem to be fairly solid. 
So I kind of just alluded to it there as I was thinking back, you know, what do the differences between actual and predicted weight mean for average daily gain estimation? So we've got the average daily gains on the right, um, you know, in those regression or those those contemporary groups up around the mid 20s. That's a good point to look at on the graph because that's where most of the, the differences or deviations exist, or some of it exists in different parts of the graph as well. But that's just a good place for your eye to hone in on for a second. Um, you know, what what did they did those contemporary groups have big differences between actual and predicted weights at any one time? A little bit. They, they were statistically significant from zero. And what is the variation in regression coefficient? So is it the is it the, the regression coefficient that we use, um, or the, the, the was it the predicted weight that was totally out that was driving it? So it's not really the predicted weight. They're a little bit different from one in those regression coefficients when you regress predicted on actual, um, and because they're slightly different from one, significantly different, they end up being magnified in average daily gains that kind of drift. Um, a little further away from, from a difference of zero. So that's the first part of the test, or the first part of the study. The second part of the study um, is length of test. Just wondering, I didn't keep time in this. Huh? I didn't keep time in no, this. No. Okay. Okay. So the second part of the study is to do with the length of test. Can more frequent data recording or lightweight measures, whether they're partial or predicted, can that facilitate a shortening of the, the performance test period? And if you look to the BIF guidelines, we think about a 70-day test as the recommended test period for assessing average daily gain. Um, and essentially on performance tests, it's, it's average daily gain is the driver of what is the shortest part of the test. We can get a good handle on feed intake at a lot fewer days, but it's the actual variation around average daily gain that drives the, the length of test. Um, sans the burning period or the adaptability period before that 70 days. So objective two, the analysis for this, we kind of approached it a slightly different way. Um, we looked at average daily gain estimates from different lengths of test periods, so short periods and long periods. So you remember that all tests ran from between 63 days to 175 days. We would have cut off the longer test periods at the 70 days. So all the test periods inside there were 63 to 70 days. Um, we had average daily gain. We looked at average daily gain estimated from the partial weights and average daily gain <coughs> estimated from the predicted weights. Um, and there was one edit that we had a look at that we didn't know whether it was appropriate or not. And that was editing the partial weights for abnormal growth rates. Now you would do this normally with shoot weights. If an animal doesn't exhibit, if you look at an animal's growth rate and time doesn't exhibit or explain, um, you know, if the R squared of regressing average daily gain on days is not over 0.9, you would class that as, as an abnormal growth rate. And the practice would be is to chuck that data away. Some would argue maybe you should leave it in because it's probably a real reflection of a bad animal but usually you, you would chuck this away. So we had a quick look to see if this mattered, whether you impose this on a partial body weight or not. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll put in a spoiler because there's a lot of reference to this in the next few slides. Um, we, we'd probably say that you wouldn't because some of the fluctuations from day to day, it actually gets rid of a lot of the data when you impose that R squared on partial body weights. So there's something going on there that the fluctuations day to day, within day on partial body weights is probably, um, you know, not exactly analogous to what's happening with a full body weight. So we did complete it twice, but I'll kind of focus on the, the ones that have the, um, the edit without the, the, 90, the, the R squared of 0.9. So for this first one, we did kind of a, a grid scan. Essentially, we, we looked at, okay, 70 day test period, let's split it in two and let's see what happens. And the way we approached it is we had average daily gain at the start, average daily gain in period one, average daily gain in period two, and average daily gain from the whole period. And we wanted to see if you just had a 35 day test period, how much variation in average daily gain as measured through a full test period was left on the table. So you're, we kind of did a, so looking, using a type one some of the squares, we fit these um, 
sequentially, so you can get a partial R squared of the second period. The sum of these results, um, when we regressed predicted average daily gain in the first part of the test and full average daily gain, there was still a lot of variation left to explain. So the, the, the R squared at the start of that, um, you can see it in the top graph on the right there, the R squared when you regressed average daily gain of 35 days on a full average daily gain was averaging about 0.55. So still a lot of variation on the table. Um, only two contemporaries had an R squared of over 0.9. Um, when you include average daily gain of the second part in that equation and you look at the partial R squared, um, only three contemporary groups had a partial R squared of less than 0.1. So the first and second half explained a similar proportion of variation in the full. So, you know, Y equals, so your full average daily gain equals average daily gain part one plus part two. <laughs> So your partial R squared um, of the second part and the R squared of the first part were very similar. 66% um, of the contemporary group um, weight predictions differed significantly from the actual. So what you kind of start to take away from this is that 35 days sounds like it's a bit too short. Um, when you filter animals for that abnormal growth rate, you actually get rid of a lot of the data and it only retains 62% of the data. Um, another way to look at this, so this was a cross contemporary group. When we start looking at this within contemporary group, those um, R squares, the, the initial and the partial, are very similar. You include all contemporary groups as fixed effects, and the average daily gain in the first half of the death period explains 51%. So it's still a lot of variation in full average daily gain um, on the table. The latter half explains only 33%. So we repeated this and we split the data at 50 days, so 50 days and 20 days to the right hand side of it. Again, we looked at the, the mean R squared and the partial R squared across contemporary groups. Um, so 83% and 26% respectively for the mean and the, the partial R squares. Um, you would say that that's actually providing a significant amount of information still. That 0.26 is still a little bit of variation left on the table, but of course, we were looking at this across contemporary groups. So I'll skip past that main bullet point for a second and I'll get to this bullet point that when we start looking at this variation within contemporary group, um, that first 50 days actually explains about 80% of the whole test period of the 70 days average daily gain. And there is only about 2% left on the table once you split it at 50 days and you're looking at that within contemporary group. So across contemporary group and within contemporary group models, um, Different slightly, and it, it's better to take home um, what's happening within contemporary group um, when, when you're judging what's left on the table. Finally, we say, right, 50 days seems to be working well. Let's go back between the, the 35 and the 50, and we repeated it for 43 days, and essentially that didn't do any good. I won't go through all the, the percentages of variances, but it, you know it's all laid out in the paper if you need to look at it more. But essentially what we would have um, concluded from this is that if you needed to shorten the period and you had partial body weights and predicted body weights on every day of test, 50 days of the test um, would be appropriate to, to shorten your test too. Subjectively, if you think about shortening a test period, it's not entirely a statistical consideration. Um, you know, you, you do want to be as precise as possible. So that's going to come from the 70 days. So as you get towards 70 days, there's very, very little, if no variation in average daily gain remaining to be explained. Um, plus once the, the test is longer over those 70 days, you actually have a good chance of overlapping constant ages between different contemporary groups. If you're interested in say 600 day weight or a, a, a specific weaning weight of some sort. Um, but a shorter test period is more opportunity for linear growth rates. Uh, more animals can be tested um, when capacity or cost per test is a limiting factor. Um, you know, the shorter the test, there's a bit of inaccuracy may creep into average daily gain estimation. But again, if you have enough of them, if you're thinking of a, a national genetic improvement strategy, if there's enough of these short weights, then maybe that dilutes any error that's uh, um, inherently inside there. And again, I just want to highlight before I get to my conclusions, there are a few Vitelli personnel in the audience. 
this was an independent look at their data, but I'm sure they would be happy to answer any questions you have on how you know you start off on these tests and how animals are adapted to these tests and how the, the data and the, the algorithm and the, the coefficients work for all these. Um, so to conclude what came from this paper, um, these results are specific to this proprietary system and also to the contemporary groups that were represented in this system. So those contemporary groups on the gross safe beef or the, the in-pen weighing system between 20, uh, 2016 and 2020. Um, we do, we should be cognizant as well that we were comparing those predicted weights to shoot weights, which we know also have error inside them from a few reasons I would have listed previously. And if I was to play devil's advocate for a second, you could flip the switch and say, well, is the predicted, the person in the predicted, the predicted gold standard and, and is the, is there actually a lot of error in the, in the shoot weights? So I, I don't know the answer to that. Somewhere in the middle of all that is, is probably the correct answer. And we won't get too philosophical about it, but what is the weight you're looking for anyway? Um, <laughs> so be confident that there's error in all the, the body weight measures. Uh, predicting full body weight from partial body weight, it's likely to have acceptable accuracy for most applications. Um, a contemporary group specific start and end coefficient, we would think are, are, are good um, things to strive for, whether it's implemented now or not. Um, later in the test, can learn from the start of the test. You know, you, you shouldn't be afraid of maybe changing the start predictions as the test goes on and you start to learn more about a contemporary group. So absolutely ripe for a machine learning or an AI approach, which I think is being done. Um, and there will always be some degree of error prediction. Um, yeah, when, when capacity of, of or cost per test is a limiting factor, 50 days per test is appropriate. Um, and again, if the number of animals available is your limiting factor, then why not do a longer test? You, you, you'll get the data that you're, you're, you're definitely looking. Um, and just before I thank you, a few other thoughts if I have one more minute. Um, more frequent measures may present an opportunity to get overshoot way measurement error. As I said before, those gut fills, time of day, scale errors, um, ripe for a machine learning approach. Uh, there's a higher chance of capturing that constant weight. Um, but coming to a genetic evaluation standpoint, there also could be opportunity and it should be looked into is actually using those partial weights. Why, you know, getting away even from troubling ourselves with predicting a weight from a partial weight, you could actually take all the other weight data inside in a genetic evaluation, estimate the variance and covariance components of the partial weight with all the other weights and just put it in as a proxy or predictor trait. Could be another way to, to use that data. Uh, thanks again for the invite. Uh, thanks for your attention. Um, hopefully that wasn't too choppy. Mike McNeil led that. He was really invested in it. He's sorry he couldn't be here this week. Um, and thanks again to the other people on the team, to Vitelli for the invite, and also to a colleague of mine, Catherine Grant, who helped me out with the data visualization stuff. So thank you.